the things that I'm going to tell you about today are horrendous, but the flip side of it is some of the things that, that the New World Order and the Illuminati know, if they were put to good use, would be fantastic. But if you, if you saw what I've seen, it would make you angry that these people are taking what could be used for the elevation of mankind and they're using it to enslave us. Evil men have already divided up the world into regions and they've got it all planned. They want to rule the world. Their goal is to reduce the population to a half billion with a few of them as the, right, you know, the, the elite get to rule the world. God has plans for the world and so does Satan. And Satan's plan is no people here, maybe just a few, and a one world government. The Bible says perilous times shall come. The people will be fierce, despisers of those that are good. Christians are going to be absolutely hated. strategy for America in this period when really a new world order can be created it's a great opportunity it isn't just a crisis we know the race is not to the swift nor the battle to the strong do you not think an angel rides in the whirlwind and directs this storm but I do have one question during the crisis or any time that you're aware of uh, has the Federal Reserve or Treasury participated in any gold swaps arrangements? Uh, we don't. The Federal Reserve does not own any gold at all. We have not owned gold since 1934. Don't burn me once again! <laughs> <laughs> now believe, Wayne, which hither ye have fought from regions where I reign. Which passages of scripture should guide our public policy? Should we go with uh, Leviticus, which uh, suggests slavery is okay, and that eating uh, shellfish is an abomination? Or we could go uh, with uh, Deuteronomy, which suggests stoning your child if he strays from the faith? Or should we just stick to the Sermon on the Mount, a passage that is so radical that it's doubtful that our own defense department would survive its application. readings have told me, for what it's worth, that some of us will be able to have ascended abilities, I mean full-on ascended abilities, prior to the actual shift happening. So that would be very cool, because what we're expecting after 2012 is a 100 times more harmonious utopian world, where things like time travel, levitation, instant telepathy, instant healing, telekinesis, are as common and as everyday as breathing. What is at stake is more in one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order, where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind. Peace and security, freedom and the rule of law. I want to tell you about a few of the things that I have learned during these last five years of intensive research. Perhaps the most startling thing that I can share with you 
is that all of the conspiracy theories that you've ever heard about one world government, about the UN takeover of the world, all of those conspiracies have now been laid to rest. There's nothing conspiratorial about it. It's all published. <laughs> the UN funded Commission on Global Governance began meeting in 1992 in earnest and met for four years and last fall released their final report. It is entitled, Our Global Neighborhood. If the Bible is simply a book of myths, fairy tales, and stories, then it is disturbingly accurate in describing what we see unfolding in our current world climate. In my personal journey, I've come to the conclusion that the biblical worldview best explains the origin of evil and its many symptoms to mankind. It explains human suffering and the inescapable reality of death and decay that we experience in this world. But most importantly, it reveals why mankind has used deception as its most powerful and reliable instrument to carry out the plan set in motion by an ancient hate. Alex Jones, in his film Endgame, Blueprint for Global Enslavement, summarizes the sacred mission of the global elite as, quote, to have a two-class system where the underclass are forced to live as slaves in tiny enclosed cities, while the elite enjoy the land of the earth, evolve into superhumans with the aid of implantable technologies, live eternal lives, and travel the cosmos. This is the promise given to the inner members of the New World Order and the agenda of the Bilderberger Group, end quote. This sacred mission of the world elite has been the primary motivation for the establishments of several layers upon layers of systems in this world. The following sectors are the major components of infiltration in this plan. They include the political, economic, military, scientific, educational, technological, and social facets with the spiritual ideologies being the main ingredient guiding this massive deception. Many of these facets overlap and build on each other. Using these various components of human society, the world elite are tirelessly working to allow the formation of a one-world currency, massive depopulation, a one-world religion, and of course, a one-world government. With the speed at which things are changing and evolving, Never in human history has this plan been more attainable than today. But as I sorted through the many tentacles of this plan, I found that not only are we, the people of the world, victims, but the people who promote and continue to instigate the new world order and the promise of a new age are perhaps the most deceit and are the ultimate victims. The idea of what the ultimate goal for the new world order is something that bothered me a lot in my early and really a lot of my research for what the new world order was as I was learning things like you know the stuff in the food and the water and, and all of the stuff that you learn you know the genocide and the and, and the planned population reduction and the mind control and all the stuff that was going on what did it all mean what was it leading up to the control grid you know the the cameras and the one world government and the one world economy and and all the stuff what did it mean because the thing that got me is what, what happens if they get it? You know, what happens if they finally control everybody? It's a total lockdown, New World Order, 1984, Brave New World, whatever. It actually is that system. What then? You know, is everybody, is it all going to just end and everybody sits back and they drink lemonade and say, hey, we did it, guys. Uh, but then the connection to, to Satanism is really what started to pique my interest early on and that they were theistic, you know, Satanists. They really did believe that Satan was God and they, they actively worshiped him and received instructions from the spirit world. Uh, that was what tripped me out and to see that network and, and every door that was kicked down, you know, investigate an investigation led to somewhere, some Satanistic connection. So 
the the answer to what the ultimate goal and the question of who or what do I believe is behind it is the same. That is the Antichrist. The, the system is being built around us, the control grid, the economy, everything is being built to force everyone to worship the Antichrist. That is what this is all about. That That's what makes everything make sense. It's the one component that makes everything make sense. And so what is behind it is a, a spiritual agenda, as it says in Ephesians 6.12. But it's also something that experientially that you can see in the research of the New World Order. That they are attending rituals, they are receiving instruction from those rituals, and that, that instruction is to do the nuts and bolts things, to create the system, to do this, to, to do the the poisoning or whatever, all the different conspiracies that are a part of that have some sort of mechanism or use in this future world government, world religion, world economy, which has one purpose, is to extract the worship of humanity for an ancient cherub. Tom Horn, in his book, Apollyon Rising 2012, stated, quote, Behind the scenes and beyond view of the world's uninitiated members, the alchemy and rituals of the occult masters, Illuminists, Masons, Bonesmans, Bilderbergers, and Bohemians, have combined to harmonize so completely within recent U.S. foreign and domestic policies as to clearly point to a terrifying civil conjecture, a near-future horizon upon which a leader of indescribable brutality will appear. Although this false prince of peace will seem at first to hold unique answers to life's most challenging questions, ultimately he will make the combined depravities of Antiochus Epiphanes, Hitler, Stalin, and Genghis Khan look like child's play. So I really see what's going to happen there is there's going to be uh, some person who's just born as a man, he grows up, I believe he's going to be part of the secret societies. He's going to have tremendous influence and power and access to all kinds of high-tech stuff. And among that will be the process uh, known as recombinant DNA. And rec with recombinant DNA, you can actually open up a, a gene or a, a DNA strand, and you can insert a, a foreign gene into that. So I think what's going to happen is he's going to take Satan's DNA, Satan's genetic code, and he's going to insert it into his own body. And then he is going to become a chimera. He's going to, be, going to become the beast by actually going through this transformation. The crazy thing is that we have the technology. We know that the sons of God came and did this back in the days of Noah. So we have a biblical precedence for this. And I think we're seeing these kinds of things happening already today. To understand the biblical worldview of the New World Order, we must first look at the fall of mankind as recorded in Genesis 3. This chapter reveals the origin of the plan, who's behind it, and where it's going. No other ancient text reveals so much about the nature of evil and its methods than the Bible, and this is where it all begins. We all know the story. Adam and Eve were created by God in the Garden of Eden. God's creation was good, and mankind was very good. God had one commandment for Adam and Eve to follow. A serpent came and tempted Eve to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This is where it all begins. Prior to this point, mankind was not susceptible to death, but Satan had other plans. The first lie ever recorded in human history comes from the mouth of Satan himself. Satan, being the father of lies, was able to redefine what good meant. Upholding to the traits of a great deception, Satan's lie contained some truth. But to understand how this lie has permeated throughout history and is being used to create the New World Order, we must break down this passage. Satan knew that when they ate of the fruit of this tree, that mankind would be subject to death. This lie is the foundation for New Age ideas like reincarnation. It is the idea that even though we may physically die, there is no heaven or hell, but instead we return with another opportunity to attain enlightenment. 
It is also the one lie that many of the world elite believe today, which is that through the use of intellect, technology, and science, man will achieve immortality. This will become more obvious as we look into the sacred promise or ancient hope held close to those who are at work for the New World Order. Satan was implying here that secret knowledge and wisdom will be available to them. This is the main proponent behind the nature of secrecy which all secret societies possess. It is the idea that unattainable information will be partitioned to those who submit to the request of the one who holds the knowledge. It also plays on the hope promoted by the New Age movement, which claims that we are all spiritually evolving into a higher consciousness, and that if one would only tap into this universal energy force, they would realize that they are God. The New World Order and its components, secret societies, New Age movement, transhumanist movement, and even the alien agenda in many ways is predicated on this one lie. The idea that man would become God is the elusive carrot on a stick that has been behind many, if not all, of man's attempts to acquire power, authority, and dominion over the masses while conquering death and nature in the process. Furthermore, we can trace ideas like pantheism and the concept that God is a force or that everything within the universe is God and thus we are God back to this lie. It is the ultimate deception because it plays on human pride. It is the driving force behind ideas such as morality is relative and karma. It is the denial of evil and accountability to sin. This is the core of the Luciferian doctrine. It is the blueprint to what the select group of men have been working on for centuries. Exclusive knowledge to achieve immortality and become gods, all without the help of the Creator God, but by our own use of intellect. As we will come to see, this idea, which goes by many names like the Sacred Promise and an Ancient Hope, has been sought after by men for centuries. Here's the way they look at it. Here's their metaphor for the end of innocence. Adam and Eve were held prisoner in the Garden of Eden by an unjust, cruel, and vindictive God. Until Lucifer, through his agent Satan, set man free from this garden by giving him the gift of intellect. Through the use of intellect, man will conquer the earth, will conquer nature, and will himself become God. It's taught in every Masonic temple in this land, every secret brotherhood, every secret society, Every mystical temple, every occult organization teaches the Luciferian philosophy. When our founders declared a new order of the ages, they were acting on an ancient hope that is meant to be fulfilled. The ancient hope, of which Bush refers to in his second inauguration speech, demonstrates that Bush, or at the very least the authors of his speech, are well aware of the plan initiated by an ancient occult hierarchy now operating as secret societies to forge a world empire. The promise to those who help build this empire is that they will attain godhood themselves and become a part of a family of perfected human beings. Manly P. Hall, a 33-degree Freemason, an occultist and regarded as one of the greatest authorities on the topic of secret societies and Freemasonry in particular, reveals in his book, The Secret Destiny of America, quote, In this way, the old dream of the philosophic empire descended from the ancient world to modern time. Secret societies still exist, and regardless of the intemperance of the times, they will continue to flourish until the quest is complete. For more than 3,000 years, secret societies have labored to create the background of knowledge necessary to the establishment of an enlightened democracy among the nations of the world." End quote. 
Hall goes on to explain that America was not founded as a constitutional republic based on biblical principles, but rather a massive experiment of social engineering formed out of the principal visions described in Sir Francis Bacon's book, The New Atlantis, in 1627. The basic principle was that the goal of attaining human perfection and a utopia that would come with it is the ultimate plan put forth and worked on since antiquity. He goes on to say, quote, The supreme human purpose is the perfection of man. This must come first, and when this end has been achieved, all good things will inevitably follow. End quote. These principles all stem back from what is known as the ancient mystery school teachings. The ancient mystery school teachings is an esoteric, spiritual wisdom and philosophy passed down by the initiated elite for centuries. It is in fact one and the same as the Luciferian doctrine that one day man will become God through the use of his own intellect. This is the religion of the New World Order, which is operating in various degrees under various secret societies, cults, and even high-ranking religious circles. The origin and understanding of the mystery schools and its history can be found in theosophical writings. In a document entitled The Mystery Schools, written by Grace Noach of the Theosophical Society, reveals the origin of the ancient mystery teachings. She opens the document, quote, Millions upon millions of years ago, in the darkness of prehistory, humanity was an infant, a child of Mother Nature, unawakened, dreamlike, wrapped in the cloak of mental somnolence. Recognition of egoity slept, instinctual consciousness alone was active. Like a stream of brilliance across the horizon of time, divine beings, manas and putras, sons of mind, descended among the sleeping humans, and with the flame of intellectual solar fire lighted the wick of latent mind, and lo, the thinker stirred. Self-consciousness wakened, and man became a dynamo of intellectual and emotional power, capable of love, of hate, of glory, of defeat. Having knowledge, he acquired power. Acquiring power, he chose. Choosing, he fashioned the fabric of his future, and the perception of this ran like wine through his veins." End quote. She goes on to explain the Atlantean connection as, quote, Time marched on and the race waxed lustily in power. As Lumeria gave birth to Atlantis, the third race to the fourth, the fiercest battle was waged, the war between the lords of light and truth and the lords of darkness and ignorance. Thus were established some four or five million years ago, when Atlantis was threatening to destroy itself through spiritual iniquity, the first mystery schools. From these early centers sprang other mystery schools in all parts of the Atlantean world. By the time the Atlanteans were in their heyday of material splendor, these schools were working their hardest to stem the increasing tide of sorcery." H.P. Blavatsky, founder of Theosophy and touted as one of the greatest writers on the topic of the occult and esoteric wisdom, stated that her book, The Secret Doctrine, is the re-emergence of the ancient mystery school teachings, as quote, The secret doctrine is the accumulated wisdom of all ages, the mysterious power of occult symbolism, that the facts which have actually occupied countless generations of initiated seers and prophets to marshal, to set down and explain in the bewildering series of evolutionary progress. It is the uninterrupted record covering thousands of generations of seers whose respective experiences were made to test and to verify the traditions passed orally by one early race to another of the teachings of higher and exalted beings who watch over the childhood of humanity." End quote. Alice Bailey, a theosophist and writer, co-founder of Lucius Trust, formerly known as Lucifer Publishing, wrote in her occult classic known as The Externalization of the Hierarchy regarding the initiation of all humanity into the ancient mystery schools as, quote, This little-known divine energy now streams out from Shambhala. It embodies in itself the energy which lies behind the world crisis of the moment. It is the will of God to produce certain racial and momentous changes in the consciousness of the race which will completely alter man's attitude to life and his grasp of the spiritual, esoteric, and subjective essentials of living. It is this force which will bring about, in conjunction with the energy of love, that tremendous crisis, imminent in the human consciousness, which we call the second crisis, the initiation of the race into the mystery of the ages, into that which has been hid from the beginning." End quote. 
The foundation behind all that is the ancient mystery school teachings are founded upon the idea that once again, man was given the gift of creativity and intellect so that we ourselves can achieve godhood and become the divine beings of which we were supposed to be through the process of evolution. This idea goes directly against biblical Christianity, who offers salvation to anyone who believes in Jesus Christ. This is why the modern era writers on the topic of the ancient mysteries go to great lengths to try to discredit Christianity and why secret societies have infiltrated its religious institutions to corrupt many sectors of Christianity, allowing historians to paint a picture of the faith which is utterly false. Most of the attempted discrediting of Christianity in these writings refer to the idea that was presented in the first section of the film Zeitgeist. In fact, it is my belief that Zeitgeist is the carrying out of what Alice Bailey referred to as the initiation of the race into the mystery of the ages. Bailey in the same book, Externalization of the Hierarchy, goes on to describe her opinion about Christianity as, quote, Christianity must also be overthrown because it is based on Jewish sources. The rule of Christ must come to an end because only the rule of force is right. In the world order of the Axis powers, the individual has no rights, has no freedom except insofar as he serves the state. There will be no liberty of thought or conscience. All issues will be decided by the state, and the private citizen will have no right to an opinion. Men will be drafted like slaves into the service of the state." End quote. Bailey goes on to explain the origins of Jesus in her view as, quote, to this everlasting compassion, the cyclic appearance of the sun gods of the ancient myths, the world saviors and the avatars bear witness and are the guarantee." End quote. Albert Pike shows his opinion on Christianity and morals and dogma, stating, quote, The teachers, even of Christianity, are in general the most ignorant of the true meaning of that which they teach. There is no book of which so little is known as the Bible. To most who read it, it is as incomprehensible as the Zohar. End quote. This idea of sun worship is part of the mystery school teachings and has been the crutch of these esoteric wisdom writings in the last few centuries attempting to explain the misunderstanding of biblical Christianity and the man of Jesus. Manly P. Hall refers to the sun in regards to Jesus, quote, The adoration of the sun was one of the earliest and most natural forms of religious expression. From a deep philosophic consideration of the powers and principles of the sun has come the concept of the Trinity as it is understood in the world today. This orb, being the symbol of all light, has three distinct phases, rising, midday, and setting. The coming of the sun was hailed with joy. The time of its departure was viewed as a period to be set aside for sorrow and unhappiness. This glorious radiant orb of day, the true light which lighteth every man who cometh into the world, the supreme benefactor who raised all things from the dead, who fed the hungry multitudes, who stilled the tempest, who after dying rose again and restored all things to life. This supreme spirit of humanitarianism and philanthropy is known to Christendom as Christ, the Redeemer of worlds, and only begotten of the Father, the Word made flesh, and the hope of glory." End quote. Not surprisingly, Helena Blavatsky also refers to astronomical underpinnings of Christianity, quote, It is useless and vain for the Protestants to explain against the Roman Catholics for their mariolatry based on the ancient cult of lunar goddesses when they themselves worship Jehovah, preeminently a lunar god, and when both churches have accepted in their theologies the Son Christ of the Lunar Trinity." End quote. So according to these writers, which in essence is what Peter Joseph did in the first section of his film Zeitgeist, is that what Christians have been doing for centuries was actually worshipping the sun and the stars rather than God and Jesus Christ. What's interesting to note is that a single verse in the Bible can explain that this is simply not the case. In 2 Kings 23.5, it states, quote, He did away with the pagan priests appointed by the kings of Judah to burn incense on the high places of the towns of Judah and on those around Jerusalem, those who burned incense to Baal, to the sun and moon, to the constellations, and to all the starry hosts." End quote. The ideas and opinions which permeate through society now in regards to Christianity are a residue to what we see in the esoteric writings. Even if the majority of the people who hate fundamental Christianity and religion in general are not aware of the specific assaults made by the theosophical authors, 
the basic attitude towards Jesus, his message, and to all Christians who believe and follow him are consistent. So who is the God of the ancient mystery schools? The Theosophical Society is Luciferianism at its core. It is openly satanic in the case of Blavatsky, certainly Luciferianism in the case of Alice Bailey. They are exalting Lucifer. He is the god of this world, the planetary logos. He is the voice of God in the Bible, according to Alice Bailey. Lucifer is God, and I think that the New World Order philosophy and how that connects is clearly tied to Luciferianism, the exaltation of Lucifer as God, even if um, the lower levels of globalization in the New World Order only view that in terms of a principle. For example, the ideas of Prometheus and the light bearer and the torch and all these kinds of things that the Garden of Eden you know, thing was a good thing, that uh, knowledge was, was given to us and uh, by a great and awesome being, even if they only view it as sort of allegory, that idea is Luciferianism, the exaltation of Lucifer in the Bible as a good thing, even if they don't completely view him as God. So Luciferianism is the core of theosophical philosophy and it's also the core of the New World Order, which again makes perfect sense to the overall thesis here that what they're doing is building up a, a, a platform to worship him. So, you have very high-ranking guys saying that they're worshiping Lucifer. And it's not just, you know, what we might think of as kind of simple Satanism, right? Where they go and they sort of worship Satan, I and mean, that's all bad, right? But it's not very classy, let's put it that way. Whereas these other guys, the Masons, they've had this secret society for a very long time. They're very focused, they're well-to-do got a purpose, and they're very patient. They've been working on this for a long time. And of course, everybody at the lower levels doesn't really know what's going on. Right. It's only when you get to the, 30, to the 33rd levels do you begin to understand what's going on. And even then, I think even if you get to the 33rd level, you're still somewhat deceived because you think Satan is actually the good guy. Right. You know? <laughs> so even the guys that, that know everything, so to speak, are still in the dark because Satan hasn't told them his true intentions, <clears throat> which is he doesn't care for anybody except himself. Ever since man realized that through special and exclusive knowledge comes power and the ability to rule over others, the ancient mystery teachings and the members who have access to this knowledge have been working in secrecy which yields power and authority over the masses who have no idea that they are born into a highly organized systematic society being steered towards a fulfillment of their plan. Many have been blind victims helping continue the cycle of secrecy and deception while believing that they too were going to gain access to this knowledge. So far, what is your problem? Just that, sir. Okay. I'm a Christian, sir. I'm pure and virtuous and wholesome and innocent. How can you say anything to bite about me? Sir, you need to be born again. Is I that, am born again. Is that, now, did you just say that you are Lucifer? I am Lucifer. Okay, define Lucifer for me. Pure, virtuous, wholesome, innocent individual that's out to help people. Lucifer is? Yeah. Luc say that again. Lucifer is a pure, holy... Virtuous. Virtuous. Now, see the Lucifer that God created? That's the same one. Oh, man, this is great. I'm going to put this on the Internet. Oh, Amen. God bless you, Amen. brother. Because that's exactly what the Shriners and Masons teach, is that Lucifer, Lucifer is light. Sir? <clears throat> Jesus said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did not, we did not do these good deeds in your name. And you'll say, away from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Jesus said it? In Matthew chapter 5. Mercy. No. That's hard to believe. So you're a Christian and you don't know that. Actually, no, I really am. You are. Because that, I'm pure and virtuous. You're pure and virtuous, okay. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In other words, you're perfect without Jesus, right? No, 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 no. Okay, tell me about Jesus. Who is Jesus? Oh. Well, he's, he's my leader. Is he the Son of God? Yes, he is. Is he the only worshipful master? 
Yes. Have you ever been called Worshipful Master? No, because I, I've just been too busy. I've been working. Get on it. <clears throat> See, this is what a Mason confesses, is that Lucifer is light. Yale University is 300 years old this year, and were you to visit its campus, you would see that it still has exotic clubhouses, which look like tombs where Yale's legendary secret societies meet. Their prestige and importance have largely evaporated, but the rituals are still a secret. And so when we heard that some enterprising characters had managed to spy on the famous Skull and Bone Society, we couldn't resist. Here's ABC's Dan Harris. The videotape provides a grainy glimpse into what appear to be the initiation rituals of a secret society that's been around since 1832, whose members have gone on to be leaders of Wall Street and the White House, the Senate and the Supreme Court. They're sort of trying to scare the initiates, make them, uh, you know, disorient them, frighten them. New York Observer investigative reporter Ron Rosenbaum accompanied a team of Yale students who shot these pictures nine days ago. Rosenbaum's curiosity about Skull and Bones was permanently piqued when, as a classmate of George W. Bush, he lived right next to the tomb, the group's heavily fortified home. From their perch, Rosenbaum and his cohorts taped the tomb's courtyard. What they captured, they say, was initiates, known as neophytes, being forced to kiss a skull, then members performing a mock killing. There is a biblical explanation for the ancient mystery schools and the idea of resurrecting Atlantis. After the fall of mankind in the garden, God says something very interesting to Satan. This is the first prophecy recorded in the Bible. Her seed pertains to the coming Messiah who would free humanity from the bondage of sin of which Satan deceived humanity into accepting. It is also foreshadowing the virgin birth, since women are not the ones who carry the seed. This coming Messiah would bruise thy head, meaning he would defeat Satan and his work. God also mentions thy seed and how he will only bruise thy heel. This is the seed of Satan. Thus the counter move for Satan became clear. Disrupt the human genetic pool so that the pure bloodline of man will not bring forth the Messiah to redeem mankind. This is the reason for the flood. We find the account of this attempt to disrupt the human genetic code in Genesis 6. It reads, quote, When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown." End quote. The sons of God mentioned here in the Hebrew is pronounced B'nai Ha Elohim. They are clearly describing fallen angels. We know this because the Bible confirms this in 2 Peter 2.4 where it states, quote, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, end quote. And in Jude 1.6 where it states, quote, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day." End quote. Programs like Ancient Aliens on the History Channel have attempted to describe these sons of God as being aliens from outer space. This is wishful thinking. The reality is that these fallen angels were rebels to God and not some race of aliens from a faraway galaxy. In fact, the whole idea that there might be an alien race from outer space is part of the New World Order deception. We will get back to the UFO and an alien phenomenon a little bit later, but for now let's continue on with what the Bible says about these sons of God. 
What the passage portrays, and it's very difficult for many people to absorb this, it portrays fallen angels. These are not the good guys. Remember when Satan fell, a third of the angels fell with him. Not all of them, but a group of them, apparently, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, chose to try to create a hybrid race. By cohabit by, by, I don't know the technology, uh, I, I'm not going to get into that, but they apparently uh, uh, were, see, angels can't multiply. Angels are eternal. There's, uh, reproduction is a process for mortals. But at the same time, Satan's got a problem. A third of the angels fell with him, so he's got a deficiency of two to one in any war that comes in, right? He's got to find a, find a way to strengthen himself. This may be, this is just a, a, a conjecture that floats around. Now, the offspring are Nephilim. They're also called the Hagibarim, the mighty ones. And uh, now, where the confusion starts to set in is when this Hebrew passage was translated into the Greek in the Septuagint, the word they used for the Nephilim was gigantes. It sounds like giants, and it turns out they were giants, but that's not what the word means. Gigantes comes from gigas, which means earthborn. So in the Hebrew, they're called the fallen ones. In the Greek, they're called the earthborn. The purpose of the flood was not just that there was sin in the land. There was, and that's emphasized. But if, if, if sin brings the flood, we better get some life jackets. No, there's something far deeper going on. That's what I want to sensitize you for when you do your own study and come to your own conclusions. But I want you to recognize there's something much more profound that God has a problem that God was solving. And that is that Satan's strategy was to contaminate the human race. Now that we know who these sons of God were, let's make the connection with the ancient mystery teachings. In order to do this, we must turn to a book which is referenced in the New Testament by Jude. It is also a book that the audience of the early Israelites were well versed in and familiar with. I am speaking about the book of Enoch. I believe it is important to look at a book like Enoch. I am not ready to say that it is inspired canon, but I believe it is worth investigating. The modern-day Christian scholars have largely put the Book of Enoch aside. As such, the book has been used by people who promote the ancient alien idea and folks like Zachariah Stitchin to present their theories of Nibiru and the Anunnaki. But in fact, the biblical foundation is the best fit for the Book of Enoch. So let's look at what it says. The Book of Enoch tells us several things, such as the number of fallen angels or watchers as they are referred where they landed, and what they taught mankind. It even lists the names of 20 of the fallen angels. But as it pertains to the mystery schools, it is very interesting the kinds of things that these watchers taught humanity. It states, quote, Azazel taught them to make swords, knives, shields, and breastplates, and made known to them metals and the skill of working them for bracelets and jewelry. Azazel also taught the use of antimony for coloring the eyelids, along with all types of precious stones and dye formulas. From this arose great disobedience. They were led astray. They committed immorality. They became corrupt in all their ways. Semyaza taught cursing and root cutting. Armeros curse lifting. Barakoyel taught star signs. Kokabel star patterns. Ezekiel, cloud lore. Arakiel, land signs. Shamziel, sun signs. And Sariel, moon pathways. End quote. According to the Book of Enoch, this is the origin of the mystery schools. The fallen angels taught mankind weapon making and warfare, applying makeup and jewelry, introduced mankind to psychedelic drugs, vampirism, enchantments, and cursings as well as astrology. It is quite remarkable to see how much of what these watchers taught not only relate to the ancient mystery religions, but are common everyday things of the world we live in today. We even see the watchers teach mankind the art of abortion. Quote, the fifth was Kasdea. This is he who showed the Yaladim A'am all the evil strikings of unclean Rakim and demonic entities. He showed them the dashing of the embryo in the womb so that it would die." Quote. 
the Book of Enoch also states that the Watchers began to mix animals and humans together. Quote, they started to sin against birds, beasts, reptiles, fish, and then to devour one another's bodies, even drinking the blood. It was then the earth laid accusation against these lawless ones. End quote. This is extremely interesting because it is information which would have sounded absurd until the last half century. It is not talking about hybridization, but of creating creatures that go beyond their own kind as God created man, animals, and plants. This tells us a couple of things. One, that the technology they had was far greater than we can ever imagine. This is confirmed in the book of Ecclesiastes in the Bible where it states, quote, What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun, end quote. No matter how far we think we've come in the name of science and technology, it seems we are only catching up to what we were taught by these fallen angels in the antediluvian or pre-flood world. Two, the creatures we see in several ancient mythologies such as centaurs and minotaurs could all be attributed from what these fallen angels did on the earth. Steve Quayle, in his book Genesis 6 Giants, summarizes this idea, stating, quote, the collective memories in the form of myths, fables, and fairy tales from various cultures and ages of mankind are overwhelming evidence that the Nephilim existed. End quote. I believe that the antediluvian world of fallen angels, hybrids, warfare, Nephilim, astrology, advanced technology, and false spirituality is Atlantis. As theosophists and esoteric authors of the last century wrote, how they believe the mystery schools began in Atlantis, I believe that the antediluvian world and the teachings of these fallen angels are the same thing. This makes sense to what the elite and secret societies are trying to do to forge a new world order today. Not only are they trying to rediscover Atlantis, but in doing so, they are merely attempting to fulfill the ancient hope which has been at work since the days of Adam and Eve the earthly rule of the Antichrist. The truth certainly seems stranger than fiction. Had even jaded New Yorkers scratching their heads, a mysterious silver shiny object or object floating in the sky yesterday. You can see all people have stopped in the street there in their tracks looking at it. Some folks say they saw lights. Others were maybe waiting for the little green men to arrive. It's a center bill of buzz tonight. A bright blue light spotted moving in the sky. And here's what you capture. This bright, fiery light moving across the sky. Some surveyors say they found what can only be described as the wreckage of a crashed spaceship. That's good group, right? Stacey Gibson can't tell you what she captured on home video, but she can tell you she's never seen anything like that. You gotta see it for yourself. These residents saw the light covering the sky that Monday night. The North Canton couple is trying to figure out what it was that they saw in the sky over their home just a few days ago. Mysterious, unexplained, orange colored objects. Karen, they tell us that they saw lights, but those lights were not from an airplane or a helicopter, and these lights dropped something as they hung low over the sky. Mike was in the Air Force and says the light covering in the sky were unlike any he had seen. What is that? Did you know it was just in the cell? They were going to do it. The espantados ligaram para a polícia. I'm getting to 
or not. I'm... One of the main topics of interest the New Age movement has harnessed through the infiltrating of the Truth Movement has been on the topic of UFOs and ETs. Many of these folks like David Wilcock, David Icke, Jordan Maxwell, and many others have in fact verified the concept that the UFO phenomenon is not necessarily flesh and blood beings, but are a race of highly evolved spiritual entities who have attained what we refer to as godhood and power over the elements of nature and physics of which we are currently limited to. This is eerily similar to the sacred promise given to the inner members of the New World Order. It is also the same concept being promoted by transhumanists and the road to attain singularity and human immortality through the use of technology in the field of biology and genetics. I believe that all of these various tentacles are leading to the same place and the same goal. More people today believe that there is life outside of Earth than ever before. A 2008 Scripps UFO poll conducted by Thomas Hargrove and Guido H. Stample showed that over 74% of 18-24 to 24 year olds believed it was likely that intelligent life exists on other planets. This is perhaps due to several factors including our current growth in scientific knowledge and understanding of the size and vastness of the universe, but also the propaganda perpetuated by our media. Science fiction has exploded in America and the world as a staple theme for films, movies, books, and video games. Could this all be part of the plan to prepare the world for disclosure? I think the New Age, as well as the mainstream sort of media, and I mean like movies and television shows, and everybody's been shoving this alien UFO thing down our throats because it has so many uses for the Antichrist system. I've said many times, I don't know if this is the way that it will all be set up. It is just a really convenient way if it does go down like this because it does do three main things that are needed for the Antichrist system. Number one, it causes the world to reject God. Uh, we've been sold this erroneous idea that if aliens exist, then God doesn't. So the headlines the day after would read, you know, God proven wrong or whatever. The whole world would be united in its rejection of God overnight. So that certainly would play in obviously to the biblical account of this this uh, world order at the end of time. Also, we would believe ourselves to be God. This one would take a little bit longer to sink in, but the idea that aliens in a real sort of evolution kind of way just evolved and that uh, you know that it could be sold to us that they were somehow our creators in the sense that they genetically modified us or they might have some excuse to the origin of life or something to that effect. Uh, ultimately, we would see them as gods in the sense of their perhaps abilities or their technological advancement and it really depends on this point of how and what they say about us if they say anything or if in the discovering of them that uh, it is implied in some way that uh, that we ourselves could be like them and therefore like gods 
And that really goes into the third part, which is the evolution. I think that this concept of evolution is crucial to so much of what the Antichrist system does, especially the the genocide based on belief system that happens in the end uh, time scenario, uh, really requires, as it did in the Third Reich, uh, an idea of evolution. There was a there's a concept that. Um, you know, there's certain people that are not uh, fit for the new, the new system, the new evolution. They were, they, they were sort of helping humanity evolve by the elimination of those that weren't ready for the new age, the new world. Uh, Hitler believed in the fifth root race of Blavatsky, but yet I think this new system is going to have a very unique version of evolution. And of course, the appearance of aliens really validates that on a worldwide scale. No longer do you have to you know, have this sort of underground preaching of theosophy as it was in, in Hitler's time, but rather the whole world is united in this understanding or perceived understanding of potential evolution coming. After all, the aliens are here. We can be like them. They just simply evolved like we have the potential to do. We can become like them. We can communicate telepathically or whatever as long as we are willing to take that next step. And there's this great precipice that we're you know now at this able this ability to move to this next level but it's all going to be in the context of you know god has just recently been disproven but yet there will be people on earth that can't quite go with the new system because they're stuck in the old paradigm of god does exist and the bible was accurate and these aliens are a deception those people will be presented as enemy number one and and will be viewed as the thing that's holding us back from the potential evolution UFOs and ETs in the Bible? Interesting question. Uh, it, we got to define our terms right. a little bit, I think, right? So, uh, in as far as there were sons of God coming down, there were demons coming down, then yes, there are aliens, because the demons of yesterday are today's aliens. That's really the bottom line. Uh, there are not aliens from some distant galaxy or from the Pleiades system or anything like that. They are very much from here, they're demonic, and so in as far as there were demons, then, then yes. But, you know, we, we can't call them demons or gods from yesteryear because that's really out of fashion. Right. But you can call them aliens because now they're from some other place and they evolved. It's interesting how evolution has served as such a foundation for this. Mm -hmm. You know, God, I mean, the, the demons, Satan gets us thinking that there is no God, that there is so no Satan or any demons. But then he starts replacing it with these other entities. And we believe in evolution, you know, lots of people do. And so that serves as the foundation for these otherworldly beings that have also evolved, not by God, mind you. But they're, they're, you know, they've evolved from a long time ago. And as far as UFOs, well, a UFO is an unidentified flying object. Um, and we're seeing those today. People are seeing those all over the place. And generally what they look like is just some kind of a, a white light. It's a white ball of light or something like this that's floating around in the sky. And people will say, oh, it's a kite. Now we can all see what a kite looks like. They're not helicopters. We know what helicopters look like. We're not stupid, right? Neither are the people that take all these videos. And, and you can watch them on YouTube. And yeah. there's just thousands of them. And, uh, you know, I'm sure there's a few pranksters out there, right? But sure, but, but still, just the, the quantity and even the quality of the video is such that you're like, wow, that's really amazing. Um, so in the Old Testament, you find places where the heavens were opened. For example, in 2 Kings chapter 6, Elijah and his servant are surrounded by the Syrians. They wake up one morning and the servant goes outside and he sees all these guys. He's like, oh boy. He goes back and he says, Master, we're done. And Elijah, you know, he's just very calm and he, he prays, oh Lord, I pray you'd open his eyes. And so God opens the young man's eyes and he looks all around him and he sees these horses and chariots of fire. Now that's interesting. Why would God need to use chariots of fire? Well, I don't know the answer. I mean, you'd think he could just go, you know, kind of Star Trek kind of thing. You know, you just, you go from here to there. But for some reason, in that other dimension, you have horses of fire, you've got these chariots of fire, and these things are, are going around. And in some way, I 
would suspect that the demons are kind of did the same thing. I don't know if they're on horses of fire necessarily, but they're when they materialize, they look like these these fiery white orbs, and you know however they're transporting themselves, I don't know, but it's not like they can just think it and they're there, but they have to somehow travel, they have to traverse through whatever medium, the spiritual medium or through the, the physical medium, they're actually moving about. So, again, I, I wouldn't say that we have, you know, what we call technical UFOs back then, but you did have these horses and chariots of fire in that angelic spiritual realm. There's movement going on. Uh, angels have wings. Again, why would they have wings? Right? Is there air in that? It's, these are questions we just don't know. Right. You know, we we still know the answer to these things, but still, there's a function for these things. If they have wings, then they must need them. If there are horses and chariots of fire, then they must need those in some capacity that I don't understand, and we're not really told. But still, there it is. So, um, what we're seeing today is a resurgence. It, we're, we're really we're just we're, I know so much a resurgence. We're seeing a breakthrough of that realm into our own and, and and those demons are coming through somehow they're being able to manifest in this realm I don't know how they do that but they're doing it they're manifesting and they're up in the skies uh, I mean millions of people have seen these things right uh, you even have sort of uh, more famous people like Ronald Reagan mm -hmm. he claimed to have seen something a number of times Jimmy Carter mm -hmm. uh, Barry Goldwater uh, Douglas MacArthur, all right, just to name a few of the presidents, you have other world leaders. You have uh, Michu Kaku, who's a real famous uh, physicist. Let today. me make a prediction, and that is sometime by mid-century, we might make contact with an intelligent civilization in outer space. Plus you have, you know, just lots and lots of astronauts. They say that every time that we had a, a mission. We were being followed by something. We were being watched. We saw some craft. We saw something, right? And you can you can watch some of these videos that have been released by NASA, and you can see these things out there, right? So there's definitely something out there. The question is, what is it? Scholars with no religious affiliation who have looked into this topic of UFOs and ETs for several decades have come to very interesting conclusions. Jack Vallee, a venture capitalist, computer scientist, author, ufologist, and former astronomer who helped build the precursor to what we know as the internet, has studied the UFO phenomenon for over three decades. After looking into the relationship between UFOs, cults, religious movements, demons, angels, ghosts, and psychic phenomenon, Valet changed his proposed hypothesis from the UFO phenomenon being an extraterrestrial origin, in other words, craft and beings from another planet or a faraway galaxy, to a multi-dimensional visitation hypothesis, or interdimensional. In his book, Messengers of Deception, Valet states, quote, Human beings are under the control of a strange force that bends them in absurd ways, forcing them to play a role in a bizarre game of deception." End quote. Later in the same book, he states, quote, "...the UFO phenomenon represents a manifestation of a reality that transcends our current understanding of physics. The UFOs are physical manifestations that cannot be understood apart from their psychic and symbolic reality. What we see in effect here is not an alien invasion. It is a control system which acts on humans and uses humans." End quote. J. Allen Hynek, a U.S. astronomer, professor, and ufologist best remembered for his contributions in the field of UFOs and acting as scientific advisor to UFO studies taken by the U.S. Air Force, again came to same conclusions of the UFOs and alleged extraterrestrial phenomenon. In his book, Edge of Reality, he states, quote, If UFOs are somebody else's nuts and bolts hardware, then we must still explain how such tangible hardware can change shape before our eyes, vanish in a Cheshire cat manner, not even leaving a grin, seemingly melt away in front of us, or apparently materialize mysteriously before us without apparent detection by persons nearby or in neighboring towns. We must wonder, too, where UFOs are hiding 
when not manifesting themselves to human eyes." End quote. The overall consensus seems to be that these crafts which are being seen have the ability to manifest as physical objects and at the same time manipulate time and space as to become invisible or perform aerial maneuvers that defy our current understanding of physics and nature. The deeper side to this phenomenon are the abduction accounts recorded by millions of people all over the world, regardless of time, race, culture, and upbringing. Dr. John Mack, professor at Harvard Medical School, a psychiatrist and writer, also looked into the UFO and abduction phenomenon for several decades and came to similar conclusions as Valet and Hynek. Although he recently passed away, his contributions to the study of ufology and alien abductions is highly touted and greatly respected. He states in an interview with Nova Online when asked if the phenomenon is literally physical or psychological, stating, quote, Yes, it's both. It's both literally physically happening to a degree, and it's also some kind of psychological, spiritual experience occurring and originating perhaps in another dimension. And so the phenomenon stretches us, or it asks us to stretch to open to realities that are not simply the literal physical world, but to extend to a possibility that there is other unseen realities from which our consciousness, our, if you will, learning processes, over the past several hundred years have closed us off." End quote. So it seems to be the case is they come from some other domain, some place, maybe not another star or maybe from another dimension, but they manifest, they show up here in our physical world. People what have a this? number of cases where people are just playing gone, a child comes into the mother's room, mom, you weren't there during the night when I came. There is burned earth outside where the ships have landed. There is physical, it may not satisfy our criteria of proof, but proof may be something which only operates within the frame of evidence of this physical world in the box you mentioned before right. that we live in this is what's going on here is something in some ways more subtle in other words something coming from another dimension into our world which is very commonly experienced in other cultures but not in this culture uh john mack who recently passed away but he was at harvard and you know according to his own testimony he says you know i was not a believer in this thing he didn't he wasn't trying to prove anything, he just kept hearing about these things. So, and so he came to this conclusion that they were, these were real physical abductions. Very, very slowly he came to that conclusion. And rather skeptically, he didn't want to come to that conclusion. But eventually the data was so much that he could not overcome it. And he had to just say, well, it's happening. Something physical is happening. Dr. David Jacobs uh, did, has done similar research. He was quite upbeat about this whole thing for a long time, but in the last several years, he's become very downcast about his discoveries because he's discovering that these beings that are taking people are smarter than us, they're stronger than us, and they're, they have a, a hybridization program going on, right. that they're creating a hybrid race to take over, and he says at best we're going to be second class serfs. So, He's very discouraged, and I can see why. You know, I think if, if, you come, if you discover these things, and yet you don't understand that there's a greater power, which is Jesus Christ, who has a much better plan, then I would be extremely depressed. <laughs> you know, I mean, in a way, I'm sort of upbeat about the whole thing because I see that we are getting very close to right. the end. Right. But it's also kind of scary. I yeah. mean, there's just crazy things going on. Dr. David Jacob, an associate professor of history at Temple University, specializing in 20th century American history and culture, has also studied the UFO and abduction phenomenon for over 40 years. In an interview with L.A. Marzulli in the book Alien Interviews, Jacobs comments on the alien abduction phenomenon, stating, quote, This is a phenomenon that is either psychological or it is happening. There is very little in the middle. I have learned that the abduction phenomenon is vast, global, and it occurs with great frequency." End quote. Whitley Strieber, in his classic account of an alien encounter in the book Communion, records his experience with these entities, stating, quote, I became entirely given over to extreme dread. The fear was so powerful that it seemed to make my personality become evaporate. Whitley ceased to exist. 
What was left was a body in a state of raw fear so great that it swept about me like a thick, suffocating curtain, turning paralysis into a condition that seemed close to death. I died and a wild animal appeared in my place." End quote. Then, in a later release in a book entitled Transformation, The Breakthrough, he dives deeper into the experience, stating, quote, Increasingly, I felt as if I were entering a struggle that might even be more than life and death. It might be a struggle for my soul, my essence, or whatever part of me might have reference to the eternal. There are worse things than death, I suspected. So far, the word demon has never been spoken among the scientists and doctors who are working with me. Alone at night, I worried about the legendary cunning of demons. At the very least, I was going stark, raving mad." End quote. Then later in the same book, he states, quote, I felt an absolutely indescribable sense of menace. It was hell on earth to be there in the presence of these entities. And yet I couldn't move, couldn't cry out, couldn't get away. I lay as still as death, suffering inner agonies. Whatever was there seemed so monstrously ugly, so filthy and dark and sinister. Of course they were demons. They had to be. And they were here, and I couldn't get away." End quote. According to many researchers in the field, and even the people who have directly experienced this phenomenon for themselves, all seem to agree that there is a spiritual element driving this phenomenon. It is clear that there is a metaphysical nature to the UFOs and the alien abductions themselves. Furthermore, the startling similarities with the phenomenon, with the occult and other historical, mythological accounts of direct contact with demonic entities, should be alarming. Jack Vallee alludes to this concept, stating, quote, The symbolic display seen by the abductees is identical to the type of initiation ritual or astral voyage that is embedded in the occult traditions of every culture. The structure of abduction stories is identical to that of occult initiation rituals. The UFO beings of today belong to the same class of manifestation as the occult entities that were described in centuries past." End quote. There is another angle to this phenomenon that is seldom discussed but is very important to point out. That is the solution to help stop those who experience the alien abduction phenomenon. Joe Jordan, state-sanctioned director and field investigator for MUFON, through his investigation at CE4 Research Group, has discovered that calling upon the name of Jesus Christ during the abduction can make the experience stop instantly. On their website, ce4research.com, the mission statement states, quote, The mission of CE4 Research Group is to share with the world the most powerful evidence known that exposes the alien entities for who they really are. The evidence is in the testimony of those who have overcome the experience, the oppression, the bondage, the harassment, the control, the lies, the deception that these entities perpetuate by calling out in the name and authority of Jesus Christ. Through this evidence of these testimonies, we will be able to help others. The world asks for this evidence and we will give it to them." End quote. A lot of the people that have seen my videos know my testimony of how it all started with one book on a vacation trip to visit my brother. I picked up one book, UFO Crash at Roswell, and uh, it was like opening a doorway into something that would totally change my life. And uh, it has, and it's changed a number of times since then, but that one started it. it. It put me on a quest to find out what this UFO phenomenon was about. And like I said, I came into it as a, an agnostic with an open mind and what I thought was total objectivity and became a MUFON investigator was doing UFO investigations, sighting invest investigations for a few years and then got caught up in uh, what is called the New Age belief system and metaphysical studies because, you know, it's part of this UFO phenomenon. It goes hand in hand. I was caught up in all of that too and it changed my worldview again uh, from being, you know, an agnostic humanist to one who was into the New Age and actually practicing these metaphysical studies myself and uh, I was able to see the UFO phenomenon through another set of eyes and then in 1996 um, I was shown the true gospel uh, where I actually caught my attention and uh, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior in November of 1996 and now I was able to look at this phenomenon in yet another set of eyes. So initially, was this what I was looking for? No, it was not. 
Well, the first case I came across, I actually had interviewed this gentleman who claimed to have had an abduction experience, along with other sighting experiences and um, other what he felt were abduction experiences too. But he ta we decided to interview him, and this was six months before I became a Christian. Um, this was in the middle of 1996 that we did the interview with him. And I used to come to my monthly meetings, my MUFON meetings that I had, and he just wanted to share what he had been through, you know, and he was had a, an interest because of his experiences in the UFO phenomena. And uh, myself and one of my lead investigators, uh, actually my partner that helped me found CE4 very, in the very beginning, uh, his name was Wes Clark. He was a very good investigator, worked for the Space Center at the time as a quality inspector. And uh, he had a good organizational skill of helping do these investigations. And him and I interviewed this gentleman in his home for two hours on videotape and just let him talk. And we asked some questions and would guide him along just to try to get all of his information. Well, we put it away. And we didn't see anything unusual at the time. And that was interesting in itself that we didn't catch this. But when I became a believer in, my, in November of 96, I was ready to put all of this away because God showed me what this UFO experience was about, that it, there was a evil demonic side to it. And uh, I felt that as a new Christian and wanting to do uh, the things that God asked of me, that we shouldn't be involved in this, and I put it away. And God says, no, I got plans for you. and you need to take the this message back to you know the, where you came from and i said you know i can't take the word of god back to these new age people mm -hmm. uh, i said they don't believe it to be the inerrant word of god As a matter of fact they don't even be believe in god being a personal you know being an entity that they can relate to so i said you got to give me something better and nobody told me that as a new christian you don't talk to god like that but uh, I did, not knowing any better. And <laughs> he answered, and he says, uh, guess what? You already have it. You just haven't seen it. And I couldn't understand what that meant at first. So I asked my partner, Wes, who was a Christian at the time, but, and uh, I said, we've got something here somewhere uh, that we need to go back and look at. We went back and looked at some of the cases that we had, and we pulled this particular one back out. It was a gentleman named Bill D. We pulled his video back out, plugged it into the VCR, and sat back and started watching and went, Oh, my. Do you remember hearing this? And Wes mm -hmm. says, I don't. And we were sitting right there watching the gentleman and listening to him. But yet we were blinded and deafened at the time we did the recording. Mm -hmm. Nothing registered until this time when God said, go back and look, you already have it. And what he shared was an experience, atypical, abduction-type experience, um, where he had been taken, the experience being taken, and immediately panicked and in fear, and he himself, actually just being a brand new Christian, called out during this panic experience, in saying Jesus Jesus help me and when he did that in an instant the experience abruptly stopped and he felt like he was thrown back into his bed he even startled his wife she asked him why he was jumping on the bed and uh, he said you know when he shared that experience he didn't understand what it meant and when we heard that we knew we had something because never before in all the studies we had done of the other work that the top researchers had done in the country, you know, this was 15 years ago, um, the big names, never before had anybody said that an experience could be stopped. As a matter of fact, they, would, they all said that it wasn't possible to stop an experience. Mm -hmm. Okay? But yet we had a gentleman that said he did, and in a particular way. So I contacted the, these top researchers around the country, got their home phones, called them up. They're nice guys. They can talk. You can talk to them just like me and you were talking. Most of them are very nice gentlemen. And I've met them at the conferences over the years. 
And uh, I said, guys, I've got a very unusual case here. I'd like to run it by you and see what you think. And uh, after I share the story, they all ask, can we go off the record? And I said, well, that's fine. And I said, uh, I'm just trying to get answers here. Well, when I say go off the record, that means I can't tell you who said what, but I can tell you what they said. Well, these guys, uh, they said that, yes, we had come across similar cases where people had cried out in the name of Jesus or had quoted scripture or had sung a Christian hymn and the experience stopped. And I said, really? And I said, first off, I've never read anywhere where you guys have said that an experience can even be stopped. And then second, I've never read where you've stated where they could be stopped in any type of manner like this. And I said, why is that? And one of two answers or both answers would come out from each of these researchers. The first one was pretty common amongst them, was we didn't know what to make of it. <laughs> and, but you know what? I would have been fine with that because to me, that was an honest answer. I mean, I didn't know what to make of it either in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I, I could relate to them on that answer, but they always would follow it with a second answer. And it was, we were afraid to go there, meaning the spiritual side of this, mm -hmm. because it might affect our credibility in the UFO realm. So huh. what I was seeing is they had research evidence part of the UFO puzzle that we've all been trying to put together but they chose not to share it because of it might of it affecting their credibility not that it was getting to the truth or it was completing an entire puzzle but because of personal issues personal hmm. agendas and you know what that's called it's called a cover-up Throughout the UFO community, you hear government cover up this, government cover up that. But I'm telling you from experience in dealing with this type of case that there's been a cover up all along by the researchers in this UFO community phenomenon that are supposedly giving us the truth and the answers to this experience. It's coming from them because they've got personal agendas they only want to share certain things you know and if you ever follow these conferences that are going on out there it's like they never give you the whole thing you know you get little bits and pieces and I guess it's part of keeping you busy coming to their conferences you know but I've been sharing the same message for years now the same evidence and it still disturbs them there are several testimonies on CE4research.com and I encourage anyone who has either been affected by the phenomenon or knows someone who has to take a look at this research. It is much too important not to. In an article on HearkenTheWatchman.com entitled Demons or Extraterrestrials Tremble at the Name of Jesus Christ, Dr. Stephen Eulish comes to the same conclusion, stating, quote, I believe in UFOs and extraterrestrials. I do not believe that either I am delusional or am I hallucinating. I do believe that the government is covering up these phenomena even though they are being bewitched as to its real meaning. This deception is part of the spiritual war between God and Satan. These are therefore serious topics." End quote. We have crossed the Pleiadians and as we've said, it is uh, our pleasure to be here at this time to communicate with you, to give you an opportunity to understand our energy and who we are. This one that speaks through us, we call her our vehicle. She has given you uh, an opportunity to listen to her interpretation of what she feels is taking place as a result of our contact with her. Not even a speck of a speck. Yet humans live their lives as though they are as big as gods. Allow us to communicate an idea to you once again. 
that we would like to call the span. This involves the idea of a span of time and timing <clears throat> that is now upcoming on your planet. Although many direct experiences with these entities do seem to entail dread and negativity, there are plenty of accounts of positive experiences. Most of these experiences are found within the New Age movement, where the experiences are not direct physical contact, but rather spiritual through a process called channeling. This is where the person willingly invites entities who are referred to as the Higher Self, Ascended Masters, higher spiritual beings, extraterrestrial entities who are communicating telepathically, entities of higher densities, and a number of other alleged beings who are more evolved than human beings. Most of the quotes we've looked at in an earlier section of the ancient mystery schools and theosophy were all channeled information. In the case of Helena Blavatsky, the entity she channeled was named Kuthumi and El Mora, both of whom were considered ascended masters from northern India and Tibet. Alice Bailey channeled the entity Dejwal Kool, also considered an Ascended Master. Today there are several New Age teachers who claim to get their information from a source of a higher spiritual origin. David Icke claims he channeled entities he refers to as the Guides. And one great example of the way this works I came across, which the, the, the beings, which we, we call the guys, uh, told us about. You call them the guys? The, gu the guys, yeah. It's, mm. it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's not... Um, it's not like, like the beings like... Uh, uh, Taro, Rakowski. Rakowski. And yeah, yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. Now, he was uh, Jesus' father, Rakowski, that's and, right. and he, Merlin as well. Part of him was, yeah. yeah. That's right, the, the aspects. David Wilcock claims he channeled an entity named Ra. I... M. Ra. It is an honor and a privilege to greet you this day in the love and in the light of the one infinite creator. Resonant raindrops of liquid light cascading down in a panoply of shapes and colors unbeknownst to the conscious mind. More and more people are beginning to claim that they are channeling Jesus Christ as well. A certain aspects of Christianity in that organized religion that really belabors, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but the suffering um, that Jesus may or may not have um, experienced while he was on the cross. And in meditation about two years ago, he actually um, came to me in meditation. I wasn't asking for him to come forward. Um, but it was a very, very powerful experience where he actually allowed me to feel what it was like on the cross. Um, I could, I mean, I was looking down and could see the, um, the pin in my feet as they were crossed and I was just, it was so emotional, but I felt and experienced no pain. Mm -hmm. There was pain associated with it. This is very similar to mediumship and psychics who claim to be able to contact the dead through telepathic means. It is quite clear that the Bible explicitly prohibits the practice of divination, mediumship, and other spiritual practices which allow one to have direct contact with entities from another realm. In Deuteronomy 18, 10-11, it states, quote, let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist or who consults the dead." End quote. But why is this so? Plenty of people who channel or have what are called gifts are happy with their ability to do so and would even go as far as to say that God gave them this ability for a greater purpose to help the world. It is my firm belief that God can take any situation and turn it into good. However, like most things in the Bible that God tells us not to do, He is only doing so to keep us from harm. The problem with channeling is that there is no way to know whether these entities which are being contacted are from God, as some suggest, or are counterfeits, in other words, demons working for Satan. It states in 2 Corinthians 11, 14 through 15, quote, And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve, end quote. 
Then in 1 John 4, 1 through 3, it states, quote, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world." End quote. God is not in it to try to take away abilities or keep us from enjoying the likes of astral projection, outer body experiences, remote viewing, and other such alleged abilities that are so common and popular in the New Age just because he is cruel and acting as a cosmic police officer. Rather, he is simply giving us warnings and informing us to test the spirits so that we can be sure it is from God to protect us from deceiving spirits who are in it to draw our attention away from God and away from Jesus and ultimately away from the true message of salvation. How many of these folks who channel entities actually exercise this basic principle? And for those who claim they are channeling Jesus Christ, well, I suppose it's possible, but in my opinion, not very likely. Why would Jesus go directly against his own teachings to send a message to someone? The bottom line is that we ourselves can have a direct relationship with Jesus, not through channeling, but through a life of prayer. Prayer is not channeling. The key difference is that with prayer, we ourselves are humble, coming before God, speaking to him directly as ourselves. With channeling, one's own body and mind are taken over where the entity enters the physical body to deliver a message. Again, this is very similar to a demonic possession. Demons do not have bodies. In fact, they seek to enter objects or the physical body as hosts. This is seen all over the Bible. On several accounts, the Bible speaks of demon-possessed people. In Mark chapter 5, a demon-possessed man replies to Jesus when asked what their name is, stating, quote, my name is Legion, he replied, for we are many." End quote. In Luke 4.35, we see Jesus casting out demons, where it states, quote, Be quiet, Jesus said sternly, come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. End quote. Later we see disciples of Jesus casting out demons in his name. Quote, the seventy-two returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name." End quote. And in Luke 11:14, Jesus drives out another demon, stating, quote, Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. End quote. The dangers of channeling are that you are allowing deceiving spirits enter into your body. It is dangerous not only for your own soul, but for others around you, such as friends and family. The danger is that it can lead to demonic possession and strongholds. It is my firm belief that exorcisms do not need to be performed exclusively by Catholic priests as most believe, but can be done by those who have been saved by Jesus Christ. Many in deliverance ministries do this very thing under the name and authority of Jesus Christ. Are the entities and alien abductions, spiritual beings and channeling and meditation, and straight up evil demons one and the same? I would say yes. As we just saw, it's not hard to convince anyone that these demonic spirits are evil and are of the Antichrist. However, the other spirits that appear as angels of light may be more difficult to discern, especially the alleged ETs that seem to have a positive message to mankind. But let's look at the specific messages people received from alleged aliens and higher spiritual entities. David Wilcox supposedly channeled an entity named Ra. In his New Age ministry, he points to a book called The Law of One as an authoritative document which he claims is much more in tune with the truth than the Bible. The same entity, Ra, which Wilcock claims he channeled was channeled through Carla Ruckhart in the early 1980s and was documented in The Law of One. Let's look at what The Law of One has to say about Jesus Christ, the Bible, and Christianity. Upon asking who or what Jesus Christ is, Ra explained, quote, I am Ra, the one known to you as Jesus of Nazareth did not have a name. This entity was a member of fifth density of the highest level of the sub-octave. The particular mind-body-spirit complex you call Jesus is, as what you would call an entity, not to return except as a member of the confederation speaking through a channel. However, there are others of the identical congruency of consciousness that will welcome those to the fourth density. This is the meaning of the returning. The entity was absolved karmically of the destruction of an other self when it was in the last portion of lifetime and spoke upon what you would call a cross, saying, 
Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In forgiveness lies the stoppage of the wheel of action, or what you call karma." End quote. So if we are to test the spirit in accordance to what we are told in 1 John, it confirms that Ra felt that Jesus was not God in the flesh, but simply another entity of higher spiritual levels, just like Ra and other ascended masters who chose to become part of the human race. This is a clever twisting and a deceptive way to deny Jesus' deity. Another interesting thing I noticed in the channeled writings of Ra was that not only did this supposed entity rarely use the name of Jesus in response to the questions about Jesus, but every time it did, it always referenced him by starting off with the one you call, or the one it calls, or as you call this entity now. In other words, never was this entity able to directly say Jesus Christ. It always had to set it up so as to defer his deity Ra goes on to explain his opinion of Christianity when he states, quote, Another example well known in your culture is the visualization in your mass of the distortion of the love of the one infinite creator called Christianity, wherein a small portion of your foodstuffs is seen to be a mentally configured but entirely real man, the man known to you as Jehoshua, or as you call this entity now, Jesus, end quote. Once again, it claims the falseness of Christianity, calling it a distortion of the love of the one infinite creator. This again demonstrates the denial of uniqueness of Jesus Christ as the one and only savior for mankind, fully God, fully human. The Stardoves, another group who claims to have channeled spiritual entities named masters or gods, describes Jesus in yet another form. They state, quote, Perhaps it may be new to some souls to learn that Maitreya overshadowed Jesus the Christ in his lifetime. Yet there is another great soul who is of prime importance in this plan the masters know and serve. That being is Sananda, our star commander in chief. End quote. This is alarming because Maitreya is the new age in Theosophists' Christ. Many members of the United Nations and other world leaders are also earnestly seeking the arrival of this supposed world teacher who allegedly is going to be a spiritual leader to help humanity usher in the new age. Furthermore, in an alleged channeling of this entity known to the Stardoves as Jesus Sananda, apparently described his second coming by stating, quote, I speak in the name of Jesus, Lord of this world and of all which concerns this earth sphere. I am he who is known as the Christ, and through this channel announce my coming unto earth once more. I am Sananda of the hierarchical board, known on earth through my last incarnation frequency as Jesus the Christ, Lord of this world and of the planet known as earth." End quote. What's interesting is that Jesus never claimed to be the Lord of this world. This is verified in John 18.36, where Jesus states, quote, My kingdom is not of this world. End quote. The Bible is also clear that Satan is actually the ruler of this world. This is shown in many ways in the Bible, one of which is found in Matthew 4, 8, where it states, quote, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said to him, All these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me, end quote. The Stardoves also claim to actually have an encounter with Sananda slash Jesus, Quote, on August 14th, 1997, I was taken up in my light body by Sananda slash Jesus to the mothership Sangre de Cristo, his Starfleet headquarters for the second coming plan the masters know and serve. End quote. All of these claims, again, go against the standards set by 1 John. The claim that Jesus was not God in the flesh and that he was somehow communicating with these people without their testing of these spirits. It should be obvious that this claim of Jesus is also different from the claims made by Ra in the Law of One channelings, confirming further that these are nothing more than deceiving spirits. In a very popular book entitled A Course in Miracles, penned by Helen Skuckman, said she channeled what she called an inner voice which claims was Jesus. But after studying the material and the metaphysical nature of the message, it is quite clear that this could not have been Jesus Christ as we know through the biblical accounts. Here are just a few quotes from A Course in Miracles that show its true nature. On page 9, it states, quote, There is no sin. On page 10, it states, quote, A slain Christ has no meaning. On page 12, it states, quote, Do not make the pathetic error of clinging to the old rugged cross. 
and on page 13 it states, quote, The name of Jesus as such is but a symbol. It is a symbol that is safely used as a replacement for the many names of all the gods to which you pray. As if the denial of sin, Jesus, and the cross was not enough, A Course in Miracles goes on to claim that there is no devil either, stating, quote, You have created in your mythology the being you call devil. You have even imagined a god at war with this being. Of course, a real devil does not exist. Using psychic ability is nothing more than using your sixth sense, not trafficking with the devil. There is no devil, each to his own without judgment." End quote. In an article posted on mountainstreampress.org, Warren B. Smith came to the same conclusion that the Jesus being promoted by A Course in Miracles was in fact the spirit of the Antichrist and not the true Jesus Christ. He stated, quote, My conclusions were inescapable and shocking. A Course in Miracles and the Bible were two completely different thought systems that were mutually exclusive and diametrically opposed in every degree. To my utter amazement, A Course in Miracles was the Holy Bible turned upside down. The Course had not updated or reinterpreted the Bible. It had completely rewritten it." End quote. In another book written by Levi H. Dowling called The Aquarian Gospel of Jesus Christ, the claims are similar in the denial of Jesus' deity by stating that we are all becoming Christ's. Levi claims he was able to access the Akashic Records, which is allegedly an ethereal network of intelligence that surrounds the atmosphere of the Earth and can be accessed through the spirit or our light body. This is the same place Edgar Cayce claims he received all of his information from as well. In this account, Jesus is not so much denied, but again, painted as a mystical master who had special abilities who simply came to show mankind how to live and become Christ's ourselves. Here is a list of claims made by the book as summarized on Wikipedia. Number 1. Jesus puts on the role of the Christ but is not automatically Christ by nature. By making himself, through effort and prayer, a fit vessel, Jesus enabled the Christ to dwell within him. Christ is therefore used as a term for a perfect human being that Jesus exemplified, a human being that has been christened, anointed, and therefore made holy. 2. Reincarnation exists and is the explanation for various seeming injustices. Reincarnation allows people to settle debts they have incurred in past lives. Number 3. Humanity has forgotten God and is currently working its way back to fully remembering God. Number 4. Time is separated into ages. These ages last approximately 2,000 years. We are now nearing the start of the Aquarian Age. Number 5. All souls will eventually mature and become perfect, like Jesus, thus ending the cycle of reincarnation. Number 6. No soul is ever abandoned by God. There are again several problems with this theology because they contradict biblical principles and teachings. And no wonder since once again these are not revelations given to people from God directly but are deceiving spirits and false prophets who twist, confuse, and distort the true gospel message. So as you can see, no matter if it's aliens, ascended masters, spiritual gods, or anything else, the consistent message is that of the denial of Jesus Christ as God. There are literally thousands of channel documents and books from people such as Edgar Cayce, Aleister Crowley, even Napoleon Hill in his famous work Think and Grow Rich. If they were aliens from a faraway galaxy, why not help us with our problems to cure cancer or teach us some form of technology that would help humanity? Why are they directly teaching that Jesus was not God but just another master or teacher? You'll find that as many people that say that Jesus wasn't really, you know, who he said he was, he wasn't all this stuff, it's predicated on the idea that the Bible isn't an accurate description of what really happened. That always has to go in tandem with that because anybody that's read the Bible and understands the Bible can make clear cases that Jesus did in fact know exactly what he was doing and exactly what he was saying. That's why the Muslims have to say that the Bible is corrupted. And so the first thing I would ask people is, what do you know? What proof do you have that the Bible is corrupted? Because as I've said before, it would be so easy to prove if it was, because there are more copies for the Bible, the New Testament, that there are for any ancient text in the history of the world. You know, bar none. And they are extremely scrutinized by people that both hate the Bible and people that love the Bible. So if the Bible had been changed, all the Muslim or anybody else would have to do is to say, you know, here's where the Bible said one thing, and then here these other ones say a completely different thing. All the ones after this said something different about 
what Jesus said on a particular issue about his deity or whatever else. But nobody can prove it. And the problem is, is that it would be so easy to prove because we have uh, documents going back from the very beginning to now. Jesus never came out and said, hey, guess what, guys, I'm God. But he didn't do it for a specific reason. Now, he did actually end up doing that, and that's why they killed him for blasphemy. You have to realize that that's why they wanted to kill him. Uh, a lot of times in the Bible when it says, and after that, the Pharisees seek to kill him. If you read what that was, it was because they realized what he was saying. They would say things like when he said he for could forgive sins, they would say, this is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And I got to agree with the Pharisees on that. That's absolutely true. If I came to your house and I said, hey, you know what? I just showed up. I'm, my name is Chris. I just wanted to let you guys know that I forgive you for that fight you had this morning, you know, or whatever. I forgive you for being mean to your your cousin or your brother. And you would look at me and be like, uh, who are you and what does this concern you? You're acting as if my shortcomings are somehow affecting you. That's crazy. You can't forgive me of my sins. And so that is a big part of, of that. And he said that quite often. He said that in many different contexts. And, and the, the Pharisees do say to us, who can do that but God alone? And so they would seek to kill him and things like that. They would also seek to kill him uh, because he said that he was uh, the son of God. There's actually places where they said, okay, you're saying that that's your father and that you're the son of God. How is that not blasphemy, they would say. You're making yourself equal with God. And this is a really well understood concept in, in Hebrew. If you call yourself the son of something, you are the embodiment of that thing. Begat of something, if you are begotten of something, you are that thing. For instance, a cat begets another cat. If I have a child, that child is just as much a human as I am. We're equally the same amounts of hu human. And so for that reason, if God begets a son, it's just as much God. It's not any less than God. So that, that was a massive claim to say that, especially in the context in which he said it. You know, he claimed to be before time, the son of God. He was the creator of the world. Before Abraham was, I am. His many I am statements are another unbelievably blasphemous thing to say. He, he was claiming by proxy, the, and the Pharisees, trust me, were well aware of what he was saying. He was claiming to be the voice of the burning bush. Another thing, if you understand Daniel 7, he was claiming to be the cloud rider. Uh, of Daniel 7. They knew that, and I believe it's John 8, they knew exactly what he was saying and, and it messed with their heads. So there's many different things like that. Another big one is that he allowed himself to be worshipped on several occasions. There is several occasions where the apostles would refuse to be worshipped. Angels in several occasions said, hey don't worship me, I'm just a messenger of God. But Jesus on a number of occasions allowed people to worship him. That is either a completely blasphemous act or he was doing what everybody knew that he was doing. He was claiming to be God every day of his life, everywhere that he went, and the Pharisees knew it. That's one of the reasons they felt justified in, in killing him. So if you're reading the Bible and you're reading this, you're reading this the whole time. He claimed that he was going to come at the end of time and judge the world. Who can judge but God alone? Who is worthy to judge but God alone? The issue there is really culminates in the cross, and what happened in the cross was an act that would only make sense if God himself was on the cross. The very fact that he knew what he was doing, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, and that whole concept of the gospel really makes sense in that context. So when people say that Jesus wasn't claiming to be God, they have to say that the Bible is inaccurate and all those things are not true because Jesus claimed to be God all the time. Both the New Age movement and the New World Order are about a coming evolution of mankind, the instant upgrade of humanity into higher spiritual beings ending religious differences, a golden age where we all attain Christ consciousness, the beginning of a new civilization of mankind. The elite believe that they are the only ones that will attain this utopia and the rest of mankind are mere cattle in the way of this goal. The New Agers believe that all mankind can attain this utopia if only they follow these esoteric spiritual teachings. In either case, the deception is called out by biblical prophecy.
Throughout the centuries, theologians, scholars, Bible students, and even average people have claimed that the end of the world was upon us. Most recently were the claims made by Harold Camping that the end of the world was going to be on May 22nd of 2011. Furthermore, rulers, kings, and political leaders have been falsely labeled as the Antichrist ever since the time of Jesus. Because of these false claims and failed predictions, the urgency of prophecy has become obscure and largely tossed aside in recent years. But there are other prophetic texts which come from the esoteric authors and writers who claim to channel entities that both the New Age and the New World Order seem to be basing their agenda off of. We looked at some of this earlier, but I would like to focus on one particular author, Alice Bailey. Most New Age philosophies, as well as the New World Order agenda, can be traced back to the channeled writings of Alice Bailey. Her ascended master, Dejwa Kool, on many accounts, gave the blueprint for the New World Order and the New Age to Bailey. Alice Bailey, especially in her book, The Reappearance of the Christ, had another prerequisite or series of prerequisites, but they a lot of them had to do with the idea that there needed to already be a world government in place. In fact, one of her quotes is, quote, first of all, he will come to a world which is essentially one world. His reappearance and his consequent work cannot be confined to one small locality or domain unheard of by the great majority, as was the case when he was here before. And she talks specifically in that book about how it's going to be accomplished through the hierarchy, the spiritual beings working with government, you know, organizations, particularly the United Nations. So she has a twofold vision that it's going to basically be a world that is already ready for him in terms of a world government. So I would agree that part of the work that she says is a prerequisite is to build and work on this sort of global government. And that is why they're striving so hard for it is because they believe they have to sort of build the throne for the world teacher kind of thing before he'll show up. Um, the chaos is another sort of part of what she talks about is that she recognizes that none of the work that she can do or that uh, the group of world servers as she calls them or the seed groups they can never do enough preparation whether it's spiritual preparation or physical building of the system preparation to actually make any of this work consistently throughout the book the reappearance of the christ she talks about how he will inaugurate the world religion he will essentially provide the fuel the power to actually cause the world to believe in a world religion so I think that a lot of times what she talks about, the, the chaos that's necessary is sort of a twofold chaos. One that is necessary for people to agree to a solid world government to unify the existing system, the fractal system, but then also to, to empower through some sort of paradigm shift, some spiritual chaos, the world religion, because there has to be some great spiritual chaos in order to get everybody in the world on board with a new religion especially a religion that is focused on one particular man there has to be major something major Dejwa Kool through Alice Bailey is not shy about letting the reader know that Christianity is the one big hurdle in the way to create the new age suitable for the appearance of the world teacher she states in the reappearance of the Christ quote the work and the teaching of the Christ will be hard for the Christian world to accept, though easier of assimilation in the East. Nevertheless, some hard blow or some difficult presentation of the truth is badly needed if the Christian world is to be awakened, and if Christian people are to recognize their place within a worldwide divine revelation and see Christ as representing all the faiths and taking his rightful place as world teacher. He is the world teacher and not a Christian teacher. He himself told us that he had other folds and to them he was meant as much as he has meant to the Orthodox Christian. They may not call him Christ, but they have their own name for him and follow him as truly and faithfully as their Western brethren." Quote. This idea is further confirmed when Bailey states, quote, There are two major factors which condition the present opportunity. These can be regarded as so completely hindering that unless they are removed, there will be a long delay before Christ can return. They are, number one, the inertia of the average Christian or spiritually minded man in every country, Eastern or Western. Number two, the lack of money for the work of preparation, end quote. 
Bailey also goes on to say how there must be a chaos before the unification of government and religion, and the subsequent appearance of the quote-unquote Christ, stating, quote, They come in times of crisis. They frequently create crisis in order to bring to an end the old and the undesirable and make way for new and more suitable forms for the evolving life of God imminent in nature. They come when evil is rampant. For this reason, if for no other, an avatar may be looked for today. The necessary stage is set for the reappearance of the Christ." End quote. If you're a conspiracy theorist like I am, the chaos, wars, and massive deaths being perpetrated by the elite is on purpose. But it's not simply to try to destroy humanity. It is a diabolical plan to, again, create a climate where people cry for peace and desire for a new system. This is precisely how the New Age movement is helping usher in the real New World Order. The world is already in turmoil. Injustice is everywhere, and that's no surprise. There may be a coming chaos that exceeds anything that we've ever seen before. According to the 30 years of research done by Russ Dizdar of Shatter the Darkness, a group of men and women who call themselves the Chosen Ones are at work to develop the army of the Antichrist. These men and women are usually victims of satanic ritual abuse, multiple personality disorder, and mind control. Through dark satanic rituals, these men and women have been assigned to kill and to create chaos when the call is made. This violent flash mob chaos of death and destruction is called the Black Awakening. Russ Dizdar, in his book, The Black Awakening, states, quote, They wait like a quiet, unassuming person in the crowd, a nice person who wouldn't seem like they can harm a fly, shoot a gun, or slash with a knife. But oh buddy, they will, and with a cold as hell energized accuracy. They wait to be activated to kill, slaughter, and unleash hell in society so the demons can dance and their leader can emerge as savior of humanity. A savior for humanity who they say can bring a new order out of the chaos. They know what they are to do, they know what is planned, and most of them wait with dark bated breath, charged by ancient fallen spirits." End quote. What is alarming is that we have already seen glimpses of this kind of mindless murdering and unexplained evil occurring all over the world. Russ Dizdar has theorized that many of these psychotic murderers are victims of satanic ritual abuse and fall into the several categories of Satanism and Luciferianism present in the dark shadows of our society. In a book entitled Programmed to Kill, David McGowan describes these soulless killers stating, quote, in a dark and ugly netherworld where violent crimes and covert operations collide, there appear to be two general categories into which a large majority of those we label serial killers can be sorted, controlled assassins and controlled patsies." End quote. Russ Dizdar has come face to face with these demon-possessed personalities and calls them satanic super soldiers. The trauma-based mind control experiments which began in Nazi concentration camps in World War II are beginning to surface today. If and when this chaos breaks out, the world will be crying out for help. They will be asking for someone or something to come save the day. We have been programmed for decades by mainstream media and our politicians and world leaders to trust our governments in times of crisis and confusion. My theory is that this is when the world government will be solidified. It will be a necessary action that everyone will accept in order to rebuild society and a chance to do it right in the minds of many. A one-world economy and a one-world government are certainly possible and within reach right now. But the one thing that will cause the world to worship one man is a one-world religion. This will require something phenomenal and something beyond our scope of reality. I think that the UFO alien thing is going to be the way that the one-world religion described in the Bible comes about, or at least play a role in it. I would admit that there are probably other scenarios in which this one world religion could come about, but none of the ones that are promoted out there now in the mainstream do I see as, as plausible in any way. For instance, there is sort of a dueling version of, I think one group is going to say it's the Muslims that's going to create this one world Muslim religion, and another group says it's going to be the Catholics, a one world Catholic religion. Both of those are problematic because the religion described in the Bible is one that people willingly embrace, not are forced to convert to. And I, I see that as both of those is very problematic because we've been trained to hate both of those uh, for various reasons. Obviously, Catholicism has many problems and, and is deserving of the criticism that it gets, but I think the reason that it is used 
uh, like that is because people don't distinguish between Catholicism and true biblical Christianity. So by pointing at the Catholic Church, uh, Satan gets to discredit Christianity in the minds of many people, although most of us would say that what the Catholic Church is doing and does is in no way biblical, but most people don't distinguish Christianity from the Crusades, and so that's a very advantageous thing that Satan uses. To say that the world is going to be taken over by Catholicism has already the problem of trying to get the people that have been trained all their life to hate Catholicism to now embrace it, and some will say, well, there's going to be great signs and wonders and everything. But I don't buy that for a minute. I mean, you can't convince the uh, you know the Muslim world, which constitutes much of the world, uh, that all of a sudden Catholicism is is the true religion just because there's a, a some signs and wonders. There's no Muslim in the world that would buy it. They would just say, well, it's demonic. It's uh, the result of of demonic forces. Uh, every evangelical, even if they saw great signs and wonders coming out of the Pope, uh, they would say, well, you know, there you go. It's demonic. Uh, nobody would willingly embrace it just because of signs and wonders out of Catholicism. And similarly, the same problem is with the Muslim world. You're not going to get anybody to convert willingly to the Muslim religion that has been trained. Like, consider the Fox News reality of America. You're never going to get John and Joe Sixpack to convert to Sharia law or whatever just because some fancy guy shows up and starts performing miracles. They're not going to convert to it. They've had their whole adult lives trained to hate it for various political and you know whatever else reasons so that doesn't make any sense at least the biblical one world religion is something that people unite in their belief that peace has come and the utopia is here they willingly embrace the antichrist and willingly give him their worship i cannot imagine for a minute either one of those scenarios being true so back to the main point i think that the ufo thing in whatever way it could be presented, there's a myriad of possibilities of how you would prove to the world that UFOs are, are real without them actually being real in that sense. But whatever way that would go down, it would necessitate the world throwing away God. They would say, well, that's it, God's done. So the main thing is done. They've taken away the one object that was in resistance to them, and now it's just a matter of providing the solution. And that solution would be very man-centered. You can become godlike you can become like the aliens there is a new potential for an evolution here a new potential for a utopia all the wars of the past were caused by our erroneous belief in god so now we have this opportunity now having discredited god because of our existence we can now embrace this new utopia and all of a sudden everything in the bible starts to make sense they talked about this everybody saying peace peace when there is no peace there's going to be a sense of great rejoicing of their new utopia of their new possibilities of this new possibility of change and evolution and no more wars and everything else but the bible says watch out that's not what it seems and that's really the thing that makes christianity different is they've not just been told that there's going to be armageddon coming and antichrist a lot of people have sort of an apocalyptic viewpoint but christianity has been told wait a minute there's going to be also before that a false utopia that's going to look really good you have been warned. Do not embrace it. It's going to be tempting, but don't do it. And so when that happens, Christians will be like, uh, okay, yeah, you guys are saying this is a utopia, but this is wrong. This is all a deception. And during the course of that utopia, those people that are rejecting that utopia will look like public enemy number one. Who are these people that are trying to rain on our parade, saying that our utopia isn't as beautiful and wonderful and potentially freeing as, as it is? They will be seen like the people that are saying that the emperor has no clothes, and therefore the genocide that is also prophesied in the Bible, unfortunately, will have legs to stand on in that scenario. So ultimately, Satan, the fallen cherub, is the culprit behind the work of the New World Order and all of its facets. The entities which directly guide humanity into working for Satan's cause are the fallen angels. Dr. Michael Heiser, an ancient language scholar, has written extensively on the Divine Council. They are the sons of God mentioned in Genesis 6, the angels that sinned mentioned in 2 Peter and Jude. 
They are the lowercase g gods who have had legal authority over various parts of the earth since antiquity. They are also the gods that accepted worship from people in the Old Testament, making them rebels to Yahweh God's kingdom. It is my firm belief that they are the aliens, ascended masters, and other spiritual entities deceiving mankind into creating Satan's kingdom on earth. Whether they manifest with bodies or are simply spiritual beings, I don't know. But the reality is that I don't think anyone would willingly work for Satan if they knew what they were getting themselves into. And thus we live in an age of deceit. You need to understand that there are these divine beings out there that were part of the heavenly council, that are extremely powerful, and that some of these beings have fallen. Because what that psalm is talking about if you read the whole Psalm 82 is that they are oppressing the poor they are not judging rightly among the poor Yahweh gave these pe these celestial beings authority over certain parts of humanity and they were abusing their people they were allowing the poor to be victimized and so he's saying unto them that you know even though thou art gods you will fall like the princes and die like men and again, the wages of sin is what? Death. So even these beings can die. While many of the esoteric New Age and New World Order advocates continue to preach their solution to the world's problems, there is a true hope that is found in a message that comes explicitly from the true creator of this universe. The real spiritual and physical upgrade that the New Age spiritual evolutionists and transhumanists seek to attain has already been given to us in the gospel message of Jesus Christ. The transhumanist movement, um, it, it really is a cover. It's a cover for the, the far more sinister event that is coming. And I, I, think, I think on the one hand it, it provides the technology to make some of these things happen. But it's also a man saying, look, we can do it. We can truly pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We can take advantage of our own, uh, our own evolution. We don't have to wait. Because again, if, if it's predicated on we've evolved this far, why shouldn't we continue evolving? And if we, can, if we have the technology to overcome death, to overcome disease, I mean, why wouldn't we, right? I mean, that sounds right. If there's a little baby that's dying of some awful disease, and we have the power to go in and actually rearrange the DNA and the genes and make things right. Wouldn't we be barbaric not to do that? See? So this becomes sort of the, the heartthrob that we like, oh, we better do this, right? right? And, you know, I think there probably are some some decent things that could be done. Like anything, any kind of technology, there's always room for good. But I really think that we're getting into an area that we should not play with. Because we're not rearranging the Legos that God created. Right. And he's like, don't rearrange those. We're going into the source code. That's what we are. I mean, think about DNA. What is it? It's source code. Right? God made the source code. Through sin, the source code got kind of scrambled and mixed up a bit. Through the incarnation, the cross, and the resurrection, God has promised to restore our source code to how it ought to be, and probably even upgrade us a bit. Do you think that uh, there was a genetic, something genetically changed with mankind in the fall? Yeah, Genesis yeah I do actually. Okay. That's, it's fascinating that you ask that, because the even evolutionists have pointed that there was some, some record of an event in the life of the original man. The record of the event actually did affect something. The, the event was the fall, okay? And the fall, uh, so, and, and at, at the fall of man is when all of creation became corrupt as well. Because everything came out of the earth or from man, right? So Eve, of course, came out of man. Man came out of the dirt itself, out of the dust. And there's this connection in Hebrew, you see the word Adama is talking about the soil or the land, and Adam who comes out of that. So it's kind of like God takes all this dirt, he puts it together, he blows his spirit into man. 
and whatever happens to man, that the condition of man will be the condition of the earth. So if man is good, the earth is good. If man is decayed and corrupted, the earth becomes corrupted. And Re Romans chapter 8 speaks about that, that the creation itself is groaning, right? Just eagerly waiting with this, this earnest expectation of the revelation of the sons of God. When Jesus came, he had the X chromosomes given to him by his mother. But his father, genetically speaking, was the Holy Spirit, right? Yeah. So the Holy Spirit provided X's and a Y chromosome because the Y is passed from father to son. The, what women do not have the Y chromosome. So he did not have Adam's Y chromosome. So he got a new Y chromosome. And so Jesus becomes the second Adam. Right? Adam is the first, right. Jesus is the second Adam. And now to be part of God's kingdom, we have to be reborn. We have to have uh, a, a new birth, become a new creation. We're going to be part of that second Adam. We're all born naturally as sons of the first Adam. Right. But we have to be born again as sons of the second Adam. Right. So, and I really think that all this is going to ultimately be uh, realized in a new DNA package for us. Over the span of 2,000 years, we have been given a collection of 66 books written by 40 people in various cultures, time periods, and languages. Today we call this collection the Holy Bible. Upon investigation, we find that these 66 books combine to form a message to humanity from a being outside of space and time by writing history before it happens. The Bible predicted the advent of the New Age movement and the New World Order thousands of years ago. It also tells us of a man who will rule this world empire and what his true intentions will be. All of this has been in the works for thousands of years, and it all hinges on Satan's ability to deceive mankind. The Apostle Paul in the first century AD wrote several letters to early churches, which are now called the Epistles. The far application of these letters are a clear warning for us today. It is a warning of impending deception that will influence the whole world. Paul warns us of this deception in Ephesians 5, where he states, Let no one deceive you with empty words. Then, in his first letter to the Corinthians, he again tells us, Do not deceive yourselves. If any one of you thinks he is wise by the standards of this age, he should become a fool so that he may become wise. In a letter to the Romans, he describes those who willingly live in lies when he writes, Their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit, the poison of vipers is on their lips. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. In a letter to Timothy, Paul clearly describes the world we see today when he writes, The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. In the second letter to the Thessalonians, Paul describes the New World Order and the Antichrist when he wrote, Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They are perishing because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie, and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. 
the Apostle John, while in prison on the island of Patmos, had a vision of the end times and the deceiving entities that will walk the earth, stating, And the great dragon was cast out, the ancient serpent, who is called Devil and Satan. He who deceives the whole habitable world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. He deceives my own people who dwell on the earth because of the signs he was granted to do in front of the beast, saying to those who dwell on the earth that they should make an image of the beast who had the sword wound and lived. Jesus Christ himself gave his discourse of the end times when he stated clear warnings of the signs of the end. Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nations will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of the birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, for then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. See, I have told you ahead of time. Jesus Christ died for the sins of all mankind. That means he died for the New Agers, the Freemasons, those in the Illuminati, the world elite, the Luciferians, the Satanists, and even me and you. God himself taking on humanity has given mankind a free gift of salvation and of true spiritual freedom. Now we all have a choice. We can live in darkness, allowing evil to enter our lives and unwillingly support the work of Satan and his fallen angels. Or we can let Jesus into our hearts and be spiritually saved forever. There are no prerequisites, rituals, or tests for accepting this gift of salvation. All one needs to do is ask honestly for Jesus to come into their heart. Remember these truths. God loves you. God cares about you. God wants nothing more than to know you personally and save you. Sin separates people from each other and God. Jesus died for your sins and rose again. You can receive Jesus now and know God's love right at this very moment. I pray for you all and hope the truth will indeed set you free. I think in conclusion I'd like to appeal to those people that have been researching this for any length of time, specifically long periods of time, maybe even years. To you I don't think this is going to require a lot of convincing. I think that subconsciously you know that a lot of what was said here is true. I think that you have seen over the years a lot of conclusions about what the New World Order is and what their motives are, and I know that you know that it doesn't really explain all the loose ends and tie them all up. I think that you know, after kicking down so many doors in New World Order research and seeing those that truly expose the New World Order, this theme, that it is in fact theistic Satanism behind those doors. I know that you've seen that. You've seen that they are high-level occultists that really run this show than that are in the shadows. And that even those front men at the very tops are only front men. And that the real movers and shakers are those that hold very dedicated beliefs about the worship of Satan. So we even have this idea that that somehow doesn't apply. We have a phrase that we'll say, which is, it doesn't matter what you believe, the fact is that they believe it, which sort of means, yeah, sure, they're all occultists at the top, but it doesn't really matter. They just, they're just sort of deluded. And I think that's a very dangerous position because if you actually are saying there that it doesn't matter, it's not actually true, there isn't really a Satan and there isn't really a power that, that they're serving, then we should just, again, think that this scenario has something to do with whatever we make it out to be. It certainly can't be about a cosmic war of good and evil because we've already decided that that can't be true. Yet at the same time, we're pointing out that these people are knowingly worshiping Satan, which is something that the Bible has said has gone on from the very beginning. The kings and queens of all the old systems were always sacrificing their children to various gods and Moloch and, and these types of things. And they are still doing it today and are gaining power from it. The problem with believing that is it makes too much sense that all of this energy with the New Age preachers and teachers and truth movement icons and gurus 
are doing mainly two things. One, they're promoting this idea of a new age coming in which you're going to be God and you're going to be evolved and, and, and all the obvious stuff that's preparing you for the system of the Antichrist. And the other part of that is they're telling you that Jesus isn't good, you shouldn't pay attention to him, or at least they're trying to misdirect you, tell him he's just this other guy, he's not really who the Bible says he is, or they're trying to discredit the Bible. There's only two things that these guys are doing. They're telling you and preparing you for the new system that you're going to think is your utopia. And then they're telling you to not pay any attention to the man that the Bible said would crush the one that these people at the top are worshiping. Does anybody see a problem with that? That we've been told what to think about the Bible and Jesus Christ by Satanists. The problem here is that what we've been told and what we've been prepared to believe is all what we would choose to believe. It's all very seductive. They're telling you that you can be as God. They're telling you that there is no real accountability for your actions. That anything that you want to do is good and normal and, and, and should be praised. These ideas are very difficult to resist. Truth really is irrelevant at that point because we will fight to defend those ideas regardless of if they are true or not. And that's why there's so many conflicting quote-unquote truths in the New Age and in the Truth Movement. You know, that's why the first thing that you're taught in the Truth Movement is that truth is relative. Oh, it doesn't matter. Your truth is just as good as my truth. And we'll fight to defend this completely erroneous idea. I've got news for you. It doesn't matter what way the universe operates. The fact is, is that it does operate one particular way cause and effect in a closed system we are dealing with absolute truth maybe yours maybe mine but it is absolute and it is one we should be concerned about looking for the truth and I suggest to all you researchers out there that you already have enough evidence to know that Jesus Christ is who he says that he is you owe it to yourself to figure out more about him the way the Bible says that he is, not the way that the New World Order says that he is, but the way the Bible says that he is. The Bible has been continually discredited. You're told not to listen to it. You're told not to pay attention to it. They do everything under the sun to keep you from it. They always have. So why don't you just realize that and take the time and figure out who is Jesus according to the Bible?